Good evening. Um, let me introduce myself. My name's uh, Sant Cervantes, and uh, welcome to um, Flying uh, Wave in Scotland, Part One. Um, the presentation that I'm going to make is on full screen, so at the moment you haven't got anything. So I'll just put it on full screen, and uh, and then we'll get cracking. Okay. So let me just. Do want to go on to screen sharing? Uh, let me just go on to PowerPoint. Let me make sure that's going to work. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Start from the beginning. Okay, so there we are. All right. Well, just uh, as I say, my name's Sant. Um, I've been gliding in Scotland since 1973. Uh, Robbie Robertson, who flies at Talgarth now. And myself brought a K8 up to Port Moak in 73. We've got our gold heights. And uh, I fell in love with the place. And so I decided to move up to Scotland. Um, I was flying from a Boyne from 78 to 88. Uh, then I had to move down south with my job. And I didn't start gliding again until 2000 um, when I started flying from Port Moak and uh, got myself a label, worked my way through a DG200, and for the last nine years I've been flying a discus. And I love flying in Scotland. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Now, because I'm having to use uh, full screen, um, I can't see any questions and all this sort of stuff. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, so you see how the time goes. So I'm giving a series of lectures or talks and um what i'll do is obviously if we run out of time i'll just stop and we'll just carry on next week and so i'll give it give us a, at least 15 minutes of uh of, of questions at the end so wave love it fantastic why do i love it because it's smooth it's smooth and you can go really fast and i'm one of these people that's really into speed so anyway what we're going to be looking at today is uh, an overview and um, uh, it's going to be broken down into three parts. We're going to look at our playground. It's uh, it's a lovely playground. It's beautiful, absolutely exquisite. Uh, a lot of the time, a lot of cloud about, but uh, often we can really see the uh, the beauty of our surroundings. Um, so we'll have a look at that, and then we're going to look at uh, um, setting the boundaries. Now, I don't like the word boundaries because it means you're limiting yourself. Um, but we have to have parameters by which we remain safe because it, it is quite intimidating flying in, in the mountains. It took me three years to get used to it back in the 70s uh, when, when, I, when I started flying in a Boeing with my SHK. So we'll have a look at how, how we set our parameters, what's, what's the way of keeping ourselves safe. And then if we get time, uh, if we manage to do it, I'll have a quick look at uh, aircraft performance. So, as I say, we start off with our power playground. Uh, before I do that, I'll just describe this picture. Uh, and what this is, is his forward braking wave. And it was done on the flight of um, uh, the uh, 12th of uh, uh, November uh, in, a couple of years ago. And it was a 500. Um, and basically, uh, I fly from Port Mo. It's started sort of north of Perth, went out to the west of uh, uh, of Loch Tay, then up to Edsel, uh, and then uh, back to Crane Larrack, which is west of Loch Tay, and then finished at, at Methlin. And as you can see by the speed, it's quite fast. It was bloody cold. It was really cold. Temperature was minus 20 and um, at uh, 12,000 feet. And uh, my camelback, um, the tube in it froze so I couldn't get any drinking water. But anyway, what this picture is, is, is forward breaking wave. Now, if I can draw what's happening, is, is I'll just get my little pencil up, okay? What we've got is along here, the cloud base is about uh, three and a half, four thousand 4,000 feet. And the wind here at this level, at the base of the cloud is 40 knots. And what's happening is as you go up the wave, it starts going almost vertical. At this point here, you're doing 15 knots 
and then it breaks forward because the wind at altitude or at eight nine thousand feet is 15 knots to so say you've got 40 knots of wind here going up 15 knots and so the cloud or the the wave bar is just like a um a wave that a surfer uses with the top curling over and this bit here is really really rough you go up at 15 knots then you get all the turbulence you can actually get loss of control uh, i was sort of pitched to when well, my wings were pitched to about 100 degrees and it is sort of head banging stuff but in this country uh, we've got relatively small mountains it's all quite safe uh, and it's fine it's uh, and it's great fun i, I really quite enjoyed it uh, Alistair Much and myself were flying that day and we went through some clear air turbulence that was actually really, really quite violent, which uh, is a bit of a contradiction because most of the time when you're flying from where it's over here. So, as I say, we're going to talk about our playground. Here it is. And what we're looking at here is uh, a northwesterly flow. Um, so, um, and this was taken on the 5th of October. Uh, and uh, two years ago again and there was three of us well it was quite a few of us about six of us flying and if we if we look what we've got as i say is a northwesterly flow let me just get a pointer up so the wind's coming down in this direction and as you can see port moat which is here is really well suited for picking up that wave it's and it's absolutely exquisite along this bit you can just look at it that is absolutely classic classic wave now we've got five clubs uh in scotland we've got the sgu we've got the d-side gliding club and on this day d-side was just on the edge of it and roy did a nice flight out of Roy wilson did a nice flight out of uh, out of a boyne we've got the kangorm uh, gliding club at Fleshy bridge as you can see, that's under a little bit of cloud. Beautiful site. And um, we've got Easterton at uh, Highland Gliding Club. And again, in a northwesterly, it's not particularly good conditions for them. Last club we've got in Scotland is the uh, Dumfries and Galloway Gliding Club. And they're actually beyond the bottom of the chart, uh, down in the Solway Firth, or just north of the Solway Firth. Now, what we're going to talk about mainly is flying from uh, um, a Boyne and port moat is basically they're the two clubs that um uh, that fly in the summer all the year round uh whereas the other clubs tend to be weekend although fresh is open during the may fest and october fest um so we've got a fair smattering of uh, uh, clubs pretty extensive area that, that we cover and we can all get away from all the sites Yeah, I'll just come back to that. What we're looking at, as I say, is that if we look at the wind or the air blowing down from the northwest, and as you can see, it's pretty cloudy here. And as we're getting further south, well, it's it's drying out and we're, we're getting really good wave. And that's basically a phone effect. So just to go through the uh, cross section of a wave section, what we've got on the uh, left hand side here is actually a very simple tepigram and for, I find tepigrams really useful uh, for wave flying uh, to predict a wave and so what we've got here is the temperature and as we can see what's happening is the temperature is reducing with altitude and we get to about 5,000 feet in this particular example and then the air is staying pretty much at the same temperature very slight reduction so that's pretty much what we call an isothermal layer and then the temperature is dropping again till we get to the tropopause where the temperature there is minus 56 and the temperature then starts to go up here we've got the wind and as you can see this is classic wave we've got increasing wind with altitude and it's in the same direction and we've got the dew point here so at this point, clouds forming. You can see the air is becoming very dry here. And there again, we're getting cloud forming. And we can see that there we've got cloud. And so what's happening is going back to the picture, what we have is the air coming down from northwest over the mountains. It precipitates out and then goes down and warms up. We have a rotor cloud here. 
and you get the wave forming. So you get the wave bar forming. And so as the air goes up, it cools, leading edge constantly forming, comes back down, starts to warm up, trailing edge is constantly dissipating. So that's why the wave bar appears to stay. And we've got higher altitude cloud. Now also notice that in this particular wave bar, it's moving forward, it's tilting forward, which is uh, a phenomenon sometimes. You can see that the next wave bar, not so much cloud, and this is more vertical, and you can see that it's damping out. Now, if I just get a pointer, let me just get a pointer again. Now, if we look here, all right, if we just do that there, what happens is you get the wave bars coming down, and at Port Moat, we've got a ridge, and basically, if the wave is in sync with the ridge, then off we go and we can get into the wave. But obviously, as we get further and further away from the mountains, the wave damps down. But what can happen is the mount, if we get on a hill, it can be in phase and it kicks it off again. So just to come back to the picture then, of our classic wave day, let me just get the pointer again. As I say, what we've got is a foam effect. We've got the air drying out and we're getting this wave forming. Now, the interesting bit is, is, is that if we actually look at the photograph, right, the wave's actually starting here. And this is about the Torridon area. And this is where Port Moak is really well suited for Northwesterlies because you've got these wave instigators, which we'll talk about later, and they kick start the wave going if a mountain's in phase with it it will kick it off even more and we've got various instigators throughout the whole of scotland that kick off wave and as you can see perfectly aligned down here you can achieve speeds of well over 150 kph if you look up at a boin in this area here you can see that it's quite showery just got to look at it you can see it's quite showery now i spend a lot of time um with uh, uh, taking these uh, uh, satellite photographs, which you can get off uh, uh, off um, off the NASA NASA satellite photographs. Another point to note is, is if you look at this wave, you can spend lots of times looking at this. Is that you can see the wave out to sea, and John Williams has used this to advantage because he's not only done a thousand kilometres north south, but he's also done a thousand kilometres east west. So you can fly out to sea and the wave is also being refracted over the water because the water is nice and smooth. This is looking at wave in a, a southerly direction. We've got a boin here and as you can see there's Stornoway there. Now uh, I think it was Christian um, Mall in uh, 2016 flew from a boy over to uh, Stornoway, the first guy to do it. The Germans beat us to it in this occasion. But uh, as you can see, we've got southerly wave here. And in this case, the phone effect is, is working in this direction, as you can see out in the northeast. What we've got here is, is uh, um, really uh, the Moray first microclimate. Um, on that day, uh, Roy Wilson did a, a 755. Um, that was uh, 23rd of July. So you don't just get wave, you know, in the in this spring and the autumn. You you, you get it throughout the year. Um, and uh, I mean, I I did a, a very long flight on on uh, on the longest day on June the 21st a couple of years ago. While we're looking at this, as you can see, what he did was he flew from uh, uh, from uh, a Boyne up to uh, Ledmore, down to Edsel, uh, which is a very good turning point, then to Loch Gairloch, and then back to uh, Aboyne. So he did that in his Ash 31. Not a particularly fast flight because the conditions weren't that brilliant. And uh, he didn't carry water ballast, which we're going to be talking about later on. Now, while we're looking at this picture, we'll also have a look at um, uh, the airways. What you've got here is Papa 600, 
this is flight level 105 this is flight level 85 and that's flight level 55 and then you've got the Aberdeen CTA now this is class A airspace so you have to get an airways crossing clearance to get through it now if you've got a transponder air traffic are really quite obliging and they can uh, they you can get a clearance to fly through it um, Usually what people tend to do is to try and fly underneath the airway. As you can see, what Roy has done there is he's just kept out of the flight level 55 area and he's got a clearance. He's most probably, he's, he's, he's not penetrated airspace because there it's showing that he's, he's penetrated airspace. So he's actually at uh, below flight level 85 there. So he hasn't got a, he hasn't got an airways clearance. Now what we've got here is November 560. And here we've got November 560 and Yankee 906, I think it is. And this is Class E plus airspace. Now, you can uh, fly through that airspace um, if you talk to air traffic and they'll allow you to fly through it uh, as long as there's no conflicting traffic. In my glider, I've got a transponder and I'm entitled to fly through that airway without being in contact with air traffic. I don't think that's a good practice. I think it's always good to maintain a listening watch and if necessary, have a chat with them, and tell them what's going on. And we've got these restricted areas. This is uh, Romeo 610, which is uh, activated by no. So again, that's looking at um, um, uh, southwesterly. OK, so we now move to. Uh, uh, a picture of uh, the wave at um, uh, when Roy got up to uh, Ledmore, uh, which was right on the west coast. People think of wave clouds as being beautiful lenticulars and all this sort of stuff, but that's not the case. As we can see, the wave bar is actually here, right? And Roy's just tracking in a uh, west uh, w westerly direction. The wind, as I say, southwesterly. That's the trailing edge of the uh of the uh wave of, of the upwind wave bar and if i just draw it out so what's happening here is is the air is doing this so it's coming down warming up uh the uh clouds are dissipating and off it's going now it may not look as if it's very good it can be surprisingly good looking at, at, at pictures at looking at that sort of situation Okay, so on to next slide. Is uh, uh, we're now looking at uh, a westerly direction wave, and and this was a flight that John did in uh, John Williams did in uh, uh, 2015. John's been up to Tongue eight times. Um, I've yet to get to Tongue. There's only six people that have got to uh, Tongue, which is um, so starting from close to Port Moak, up to Tog, back to Port Moak, to Glenfarg, then up to uh, ACN. I've forgotten the name of it. It's quite a long one. As we can see, phone effect again. Uh, I was talking to John about this photograph the other day, and one of the points that he makes is, is that it it tends to underestimate the cloud. There's actually more, he reckoned there was a lot more cloud than, than, than this photograph shows. I mean, what these photographs are are just snapshots. There's basically three satellites uh, that you can get pictures from. There's Terra, uh, there's Aqua, and there's a new one that's just come out that NASA is using called Sumi. And, uh, and I use this for post-flight analysis uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, again, looking at this, Coming back to it, you could have got to Orkney. John's got a desire to go up to Orkney. As you can see, quite a bit of refraction there. Nice, smooth sea. Up that way, it's Valhalla. This part of the world, if you can get to it, is really brilliant. I've yet, <laughs> The funny thing is, the furthest I've got has been in thermal up that way. I haven't actually got, got across the Great Glen in, in, in wave uh, uh, as yet. Okay, right, we'll move to the next one now. So as I say, uh, John, sorry, yeah, we'll just carry on with this one a little bit. This is the fastest 1,000K that John did. 
And so he did that at 135 kph. Now, he also on this flight did a 500, which actually um, beat the European record. But because it's part of a 1,000K, it doesn't actually, uh, it, it not allowed to, uh, uh, to claim it. But I think it holds the UK uh, 500 uh, out and return record for the open class. Uh, as a matter of interest, this is the one that I would go for for the 500 out and return. I've yet to do it. But the 500 out and return record in the standard class is just 106 kPa. And on this route, you should be able to beat it quite easily. Uh, because, I mean, if you look at the handicap speed there, that's 118.5 handicap. So that's for 100. So that's an achievable speed in, in an aircraft like mine, in, in, in my opinion. Right. OK. So coming back to this northwesterly, um, we're talking about setting parameters. And uh, basically, John, Ed, and myself were all together at, at Port Moak that day. And we were each deciding what to do. And um, Ed, uh, Ed Downham, uh, flying the EB-28, uh, what he was going for was um, um, I'll just bring that back. Uh, what he was going for was a thousand K. And the he's going for the Wakefield trophy. Uh, and the point about it when we're looking at fast and far is that when we get out to the edges, as I was saying earlier, it's quite showery after an inch, and is really pushing it by the conditions are really weak and he it was very weak out that way and again it depends upon the conditions but he went down to this part of the world and again when you get out to the edges they it tends to become a bit woolly so if you want to do the really fast stuff what you have to do is stay in the middle of the country uh, and so, as you can see, his his speed was uh, 126 kph. Comes back to a handicap speed of uh, uh, of uh, 109 k. And again, he wasn't carrying water. Um, so, one of the things is when you're doing wave flying, you normally average speeds of greater than 100 kph. But if you want to do really fast speeds, really fast speeds, you've got to basically stay in the centre of the country. Now, John uh, Williams did 900K that day, and I asked him why the other day, and he said, well, because it's as far as I thought I could go, which actually is a bit pessimistic, John, because normally it's quite adventurous. Both Ed and John are, are, are really quite adventurous. They love exploring, whereas me, I'm a bit more pragmatic. Well, uh, that, that's not really fair to say, but I, I tend to take a pra pragmatic view uh, and basically, I'm sort of sitting there going, what can I get out of the day? Um, uh, and so what I was looking for was was to get speed out of the day. Um, and so what I did, as you can see, the extent of my of my routing was basically rather than go out to the woolly edges where I'm going to get slowed down, I'll keep in relatively strong lift. And so my two furthest turn points were in Vareri and um, and uh, a place near Rhiney. And uh, the task that I actually did was um, starting at Comrie, going up to near Rhiney, down to in Vareri, back up to uh, um, SCA, and then back to in Vareri, and then finish at uh, Pit Lockery. Now, again, because I was out after speed, and not a diamond or, or a badge claim uh, under the ladder, I can use uh, five turn points or four turn points and a start finish. And so that compressed me into the best conditions. And as a result of that, um, you know, I managed to achieve a speed of 145 kph, which handicap works out, of a, works out at uh, uh, 148. So I will say, so it's, it, you know, when you decide what to do, you're either going for distance, you're either going for distance and speed or going for pure speed. What are you going to do with the day? You have a look at the conditions and you decide what you can achieve. Uh, and that's basically it. 
Well, as I say, um, Ed did the furthest, got him the Wakefield Trophy. Um, and he actually only got 6,000 points for that day. John did a 900, uh, and he readily admits that he under he undertasked the day, and he got 6,500 points. But I got 7,000 points, which uh, or 7,135, which I think uh, proved me wrong, please, that that's the highest score for a single flight. Uh, I'm actually quite pleased with that from a planning point of view. I think I. Personally, I felt really quite happy with that. Now, I've this picture I've put up because uh, obviously we fly from Port Moak, and Port Moak is is just here. And the reason why I put this picture up because what we're looking at is the local primary instigators for um, primarily Port Moak, but it also applies to a certain degree for a Boyne and. Uh, last October, we had a, a, a day where the wind was 20 knots at about 3,000 feet, dropping to about 10 or 8. And there was this, uh, again, forward breaking wave that went up to about 8,000 feet. And it was just producing a couple of, uh, a couple of bars. And so, uh, you know, normally what happens is you get the main instigators, which are a latte. You've got the escarpment, the Grampian escarpment. You've got a gap here between the A9, where the A9 runs up to Inverness, and then you've got another Grampian escarpment, which goes all the way up to Fordoon. And then you've got this area here around a Boyne where you've got Lot Mick coming up here, you've got Malvern, and this whole bowl here in a Westley is great for a Boyne. But the reason why I put that in is because assuming that there's just one wave bar or just a couple of wave bars you've got to jump and so at port moat we've got the dollar wave and as i say on that particular day it went up to eight thousand feet now for me to get to the next wave bar i had to go 22 miles right but that was in as i said the wind was actually 30 knots uh, when i now that i recall low down and only about 10 15 knots at altitude and i got to creef at about 2,000 feet. Now, if you get to this area here, this is a terrific area for wave production in a lot of wind directions. And so what we tend to do from uh, Port Moak is to aero tow to 5,000 feet and then try and get to it. Um, and then you've got pretty good wave here, and then you can jump up to Loch Tay. There are days when you when you when you have to do big climbs to jump gaps. And so the next, it's, it's really wave flying is quite simple because all you do is you pick a big mountain, get behind it, and you know, there's gonna be wave there more often than not if the wind's blowing and conditions are, are, are pretty reasonable. Now, as I say, what you tend to get here is a bit of a gap. And to get to in the lee of the Cairngorms, then we're looking at a distance of 28 miles. Again, when we're looking at the Grampian wave here, uh, what we're looking at is about 18 miles. The problem is you've got the airways, I say, coming down here. What we've got is Perth there, there's Dundee. So that's, you know, these, these, are, these are the areas where you can spot dollar that you know if there's going to be a wave around, it's going to be in the lee of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Oak Hills, the Lee of the Grampians there, the Lee of the Grampians there. Loch Tay's a real hot spot. Loch Nagar, sorry, Loch Mick uh, up here. And you've got Malvern and you've got the whole D Valley, which produces lift. And then obviously we work our way further north. But the problem is, is again in northwesterlies, we're getting more and more cloud as we go further north. OK, I don't think I'm going to get through performance by the looks of it today because we'll stop at that quarter of the way. OK, so while we're looking at this, we've got to look at our land out options. The thing about, um, let's just, basically what there is is, is, is a database. Um, there's an abhorrent database. It's a bit out of date. Um, 
but it gives you an indication of 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 the areas um uh, where there where there are fields just because the the Aboyan database has got a field in it which you can download and put on put on CU doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that to um that that field is actually going to be okay but what you're actually looking at is is a landable area so this is where we're coming to setting boundaries and coming to the land out land out options is really important point that the mountains are of low relief and it makes the land out landing out options uh, more more problematic um what i do or when i first started from flying from a boyne um as i say it took three years for me to sort of start getting used to flying over the hills and i think when you first start doing wave flying what you should do is just follow the lift and get the lie of the land now this whole area here all the way down here obviously you've got the occults there but this whole area here is all pretty well landable. It's great. And you can do a 300 gold, uh, gold sea flight in this area here. You can do a 300. We'll talk about this when we get to task planning. You can do a 300 and be within gliding range of Port Moak all the time. To go exploring the mountains, when I first started flying from a Boyne, what I used was the D Valley, and I'd all start exploring north south, and then you get into Feshy Bridge and you've got Strath, uh, you got the Spay Valley and so on. But the thing is, is what you end up with with this um, low terrain, it's flat. And so there are areas where you've got to be careful. This is a particular area. The A9 follows the road, follows the valley like that, up to uh, up to uh, Avi Moor. It goes around a big curve. This area here is very flat, and so you've got to be able to glide clear of it. You look at this area here, you've got to have an escape option, which is what we're going to talk, to, uh, talk about. But initially, I wouldn't, if I was learning to understand the wave pattern in, 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 in Scotland, what I would do is I would go up the A9 and I would explore left and right. And I'd always have my field options here. OK, same for the D Valley. This is another area where it's 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 low relief. It's just a flat plateau and you've got to be able to glide clear of it. And so I set these basic parameters for that. And that's my point. You always have an escape option. So as you explore, as you move east and west, you've always got to have an escape option. You never want to be down to only having one option. There's always you should have your get out of jail card. Now, it's quite landable up here, around here. The thing is, the next point that I'm going to come up to is, is that if you're not in lift by 6,000 feet, be within a safe gliding distance of a field. I mean, that was my basic rule. I obviously fly a wee bit lower now, but if you think about it, if you're in this area here at 6,000 feet, at 6,000 feet, let's suppose that the terrain there is about 3,000 feet. So you've got, you got 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet glide angle of one in 40. That means you can glide 20 miles. So you can glide into a safe area. From here, you can go down the D Valley. Obviously, into wind, you're not going to get you're not going to get that distance. But if you turn downwind, that 20 miles is going to turn around to 30 miles if you've got a if you've got a a, a 30 knot tailwind. And so always have an escape option it really is important so if you if you're getting down to six thousand feet you've either got to be in lift or you've got to be within a glide you've got to be within uh, within gliding range of a, a suitable landing area and basically the valleys 
are suitable landing areas. The thing that you don't want to be is like something like 4,000 feet over this sort of area or around here, because then your escape options become really quite limited. Um, as I say, this is an overview of, of, of what we're looking at. Now, as I say, looking at this lot, tons of us, you know, there is absolutely no issue. It is escaping from these low relief mountains that's the issue. And that's where you really have to be a, a bit careful. And that's where I come back to just going up valleys, working left, right, exploring, seeing what the pattern's doing. Once you get an idea of what the pattern's doing, then you can start setting towers. One of the great advantages of wave is its predictability. For certain wind directions, you're going to get certain wave patterns, and it's just a matter of knowing them. Now, I was listening to uh, Jake and uh, Finn, and they were working on the uh, on the principle that you need a turbo to fly in the mountains. Well, there's Jack Stephen who did a, a 750 last year in his DG 200. Uh, it was a thousand k attempt, and he got. Uh, out past uh, Sky trying to get to Stornoway. And there's Tony Sperling who flies a Discus um, W out of Port Moat. And they're pure gliders. And if you use those basic rules, you, you, you don't really need a turbo. The reason why I bought a turbo was because, um, uh, was because in, uh, I bought a turbo in 2011 as my uh, retirement present. I got a Discus BT. And the reason why I bought it was because at the time um, we didn't use the tug much. And basically, I just wanted to get to the lift. And you can spend two hours waiting to get into the wave off the ridge at Port Mo. That's two hours wasted. What you've got to do is to get to where the instigators are, which are usually around Creef and in the lee of the Grand Pin Escarpment. So really what turbos and self-launchers are for are for getting you to the lift and getting you back. They're not a land out option. You know, it's just getting you to the lift to where the, to where the wave is. You don't want to be messing about trying to start an engine. You get to a landable area first and then you try, then you start your engine. If you've been flying for five or six hours at altitude, the engine's cold soaked and it can take quite a bit to get it going. I've landed out about six times uh, since I've had my turbo and four of them have been in fields, two where I've landed at other airfields. Uh, I really can't emphasize it enough. And you can quite safely fly in a pure glider as long as you observe the, the, the parameters. Um, right. OK, so we'll just we'll just summarize that. So. Going back to it, land out options, we've got the Aboyne database. It's a good guide, but not to be totally believed. Really be aware of uh, the low relief of these plateau type mountains. Always have an escape option. And basically, you've got to be in lift by 6,000 feet. If you're not in lift by 6,000 feet, you've got to be within safe gliding distance of the field. And as I say, self sustainers are just there for getting you to and from the lift. They're not a means of escape. They're really not. Right. What we'll do is we'll finish off with um, um, dealing with cloud. Um, now, this looks terrible. Uh, you sort of think, shit, I don't want to be above this stuff. Uh, but actually, that's uh, a bit of a, the wind's blowing from right to left. There's a wave bar. This is looking west. This is taken over Perth. And that's actually, that's actually, uh, a slot there. So the waves going down like that. Okay. So cloud is a big issue. And the problem is, is again, because of the phone effect, as you're going into wind or upwind, the cloud base is lowering uh, as you go further and further into wind because of the phone effect. So it's always a good idea to know what the cloud base is. Um, and what we're talking about is again what we do is is that we fly to a safe area for descent 
Uh, and again, you know, 6,000 feet is a pretty good ballpark figure. Um, I've often come back to Port Moak and had to descend through cloud. And uh, there's uh, so it doesn't take, it doesn't, within 20 miles or 30 miles, you should be able to get to a, a safe area where, I mean, it can mean flying down a valley, which is spoken about the A9. But it's best to get into an area, say, to the west of, uh, sorry, to the east of uh, of the mountains if you're up at Boyne, up near uh, Huntley, out that way. Um, but, uh, for example, with myself at Port Moak, if I'm coming back to Port Moak, I'll use Loch Leven uh, as, a, as a, and there's an island on Loch Leven, um, which uh, Loch Leven is just to the west of Port Moak, and I'll use that as my descent point. And I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll descend. I'll do something like a, a six degree slope. Um, so for every mile, I want to be six hundred feet. So at two miles, if it's a thousand feet, that I'm going to be at Loch Leven. This is what's called a, a controlled descent. Uh, but what I'll do is is I'll I'll do a I'll put a point on 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 St Surf's Island at, at Port Mo. I'll aim to be there at a thousand feet. Uh, I'll uh, uh, two miles, uh, uh, two mile, a mile from it. I'll need to be at sixteen hundred feet. Uh, uh, two miles from it, I'll need to be at two thousand uh, two hundred feet. So on, and I'll fly at seventy knots and do a controlled descent, flying straight and level, and then hopefully break cloud at the appropriate point, and then turn to join the airfield. So, but you can use that in the veil. You can just pick a point and do a controlled descent. The other one is the benign spiral. Which is where is you trim the aircraft, the speed break out, 65 knots, let go of the uh, controls, and the aircraft will descend in that in a benign spiral. It will be safe, and it will be stable, and you can just descend. But the thing you've got to watch with that is be aware of the wind strength, because you know if the wind's 40, 50 knots, you're going to be blown a long way. So you've got to make sure that you've got a pretty big area in which uh, to do a benign descent. Um, I'm not going to get into performance. I'll leave that for uh, next week uh, because uh, that's about 45 minutes, and uh, we'll see if there uh, um, we'll, we'll see uh, if uh, what questions you got. So let me just get rid of that, and let's just see what we've got. Let me just okay. Right. Let me just do that. Right, so there we go. So let's have a look. Uh, let's see what questions we got here. I've got it on my. Oh, we've got it on this computer. Uh, <laughs> oh no, that's uh, yeah. I've got this. How do I avoid landing out or staying in the lift? Um, okay. Any any questions? Okay, let's just go down. Uh, no, I only have one artificial horizon. Okay, um, you, that's a good point. You don't want to be flying without an artificial horizon. You definitely uh, um, want to do that. Uh, you, you definitely. Uh, I would like to have the horizons, but uh, no. Uh, but don't use a turn and slip. Have a have a have a horizon. Okay. Any any other questions? Can you hear me, Sam? Okay. So, what's that, Mike? Okay, I got a couple of questions that were just higher up on the uh, on the list there. Okay. Uh, George asked, uh, "Doesn't the water ballast freeze in the wings?" Uh, what I do is I use um, I use twenty five percent. I use uh, antifreeze, and uh, uh, I use a twenty five percent mix. Um, one of the problems with the discus is I can't carry too much water ballast because it's it's got an engine, so I'm limited to 450 kilos uh, takeoff weight. But uh, yeah, I use water. I use uh, I use uh, 20. I use antifreeze 25 percent mix. Oh, so I can see this thing now. Let me have a go there. Mark. How do I get these questions to come down? There we go. Any other questions? Let's have a look. George Camp asked, uh, "Do the ridges work down low?" Yes, they do. Um, 
what can I say about you? Yeah, I have an aversion to flying low. Um, I'd rather not ridge saw. Um, you've, as I always come back to it, you've got to have an escape option. Um, I have ridge saw quite a bit, um, but I always say to myself, what am I going to do if, I mean, to come back to the question, yes, the ridges work. If the wind's blowing, the thing you've got to be careful about is that sometimes the ridges can be, uh, you can have the wave uh, crushing the the ridge, you, 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 uh, particularly right into the mountains. You, you can end up with uh, the rotor uh, that comes down low, cr crushing the ridge, uh, crushing the ridge lift. Um, but in essence, no, you can ridge saw. You can spend many happy hours ridge sawing. Um, when I had my libel, uh, I used to do flying. Uh, I had some really good ridge flying flights in my libel. Um, but I must admit, I, I tend to do very little ridge sawing. My, my, I'm usually in the wave. If, if I'm ridge sawing, I've usually cocked it up. I think the, the rest of the questions are probably at the bottom there now. The only thing I'd just like to mention is that there is a DJ cloud flying rating if anybody wants to have a go at cloud flying. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll butt out now. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it says here a Boeing database is uh, easily 10 years old. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's useful because it shows the landable areas. All right. What's my most difficult flight? Uh, I had a really challenging flight last uh, October, actually, when it was Blue Wave, and um, and that was really, really enjoyable uh, because there was nothing marking it at all, and uh, I got up to uh, I got up to Edsel uh, in this Blue Wave, and um, and the thing that I had, uh, what you can do is is we'll be talking about it when we're looking at Met is is um you can use uh, you can use sky sight and put sky sight on uh, on your uh, on your udi i haven't got to that stage yet but i'd i'd been looking at sky sight in the morning before i went off flying and uh, gave me an indication of the wave uh, and um basically i got to about 10 12000 feet uh, over lock tay and then worked my way up to edsel uh, in in blue wave and then once I got up there, it started getting little puffs of cloud. It actually developed into quite a nice day. But I would say that it wasn't a big flight. It was only about 300 kilometers. But, yeah, that was so challenging. I really, really enjoyed it. It was, it was just great fun, you know, really good fun. Um, how, how would I have done that without a turbo? Uh, yeah, because I was sitting there all the time saying to myself, what I had was, um, what I had was, uh, what I do is, uh, is I put uh, distance to go to Port Moat. And all the time I was within gliding range of Port Moat until I got to within about 20 miles of, uh, of uh, Edsel. And then I had it pretty well sussed and I knew that the lift was there. So, yeah, I would have done it without a turbo. Yeah, I mean, there's no two ways about it. A turbo does give you give you more confidence, but I mean, it's it's the effect of 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 basically being at a competition every day. Uh, I mean, turbos do give you confidence, and uh, but the sort of thing is 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 that you fly around, and the sort of thing is you've got to be careful about is you've got to be careful you don't con yourself, um, because you know you'll pick a field, and I always sit and say to myself, "Am I really going to land in that field?" Is that field really good enough for you? Because you are capable of self-deceit very easily. Let's see if there's any other questions going back. Let's see. I don't see any of that. Right, okay. Uh, I share a discus and I'm still new at cross country. Is 15 meters enough for the long term? Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'm, I want to do my 1,000K. I mean, uh, I've done two 750s, uh, but I've screwed them up both times and, uh, you know, failed to start and finish properly. Uh, so I can do a 750 in, the, in, in my discus. I'm not bothered about that uh, at all. Uh, I'll, 
you know, I want to do a thousand in it. Uh, you know, nah. Anything more than one in 40, you can do a 750. Full stop. All right, anything else? Yeah, the ridges are all more reliable than any turbo. That is true. That is really true. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Anything else? Okay. Ah, oh, that's it. Yeah, so you've got the link for the satellite photographs. Uh, how much oxygen do you use for flight? Well, I've got I've got mountain uh, I've got mountain high system, and I've got a two little bottle. Uh, I can fill it up to three thousand uh, psi or two thousand eight hundred, and uh, I can get about uh, four or five hour flights out of it. Uh, I because I'm an old git, I tend to um, I tend to uh, go on to oxygen at 8,000 feet. Um, uh, but mountain high system's really good. Uh, I think it's excellent. Yeah, Colin's given the sat link for the NASA satellite photograph because they're really, really useful for post-flight analysis. Uh, you can download the uh, sat bot. You can put uh, your flight on top of it using uh, KML and KMZ, I think it is. And um, uh, and they're really useful. Uh, no, I haven't done a thousand K. I well, well, no. What I've done is three five hundreds, uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week. Uh, but I mean, yeah. Again, what I was trying to do there was 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 to uh, uh, again, I'm pragmatic, and I thought, how many points can I get out of the day? And um, uh, and I thought, well, I can do a 750, which I'll get about 6,000, 7,000 points for. But if I do three 500s, I can get 12,000 points. And so that's what I went for. And I got them. <laughs> there we go. It's it's 15 hours, but, you know, uh, it's worth it. It's good. So who's that? George Camp. OK. No, I quite agree. It's not 1,500 in the discus. No, I, I, I quite agree. It's just point scoring. No, I, I quite agree with that. It's not, it's not 1,500. It's five, three 500s. No, quite. Right, anything else? How are we doing for time? Right. Okay. Right, I, I don't think there's any more questions. Um, what we'll do then is I'll, I'm getting another one next week, uh, same back time, same back channel, and um, uh, yes, that's all. We've got some more questions here. Here we're two thirty three. Isn't that the fastest? Yes, yes. Oh, that's Colin. Yes, it is Colin. You've done the fastest. Right. Okay. As I say, we're, we're, my next talk is uh, next week, and uh, I'll have a chat about performance, um, and then we'll talk uh, a, bit, a bit about weather interpretation, and uh, and we'll see how that goes. So uh, anyway, uh, look forward to seeing you, and uh, I hope that wasn't uh, too boring. Cheers for now. Bye bye.